Hi, and welcome to Thinking About Science again. Today we're going to be talking about realism and instrumentalism. So we should start by talking a little bit about the nature of scientific realism, and then we'll move on to talk a little bit about the major um, com competing view to scientific realism, something called instrumentalism. So first of all, we should talk a little bit about scientific realism and about how to define scientific realism. So in his Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy article on scientific realism, Anjan Chakravarti offers this general recipe for scientific realism. Our best scientific theories give true or approximately true descriptions of observable and unobservable aspects of a mind-independent world. But which theories are our best theories? Well, they should be predictively successful. However, that is not decisive. So it is often added that they are mature, they have stood the test of time and are non-ad non hoc, i.e. they're not cooked up just to provide an explanation. Now, the kinds of claims realists make are existence claims, and they might be about at least two things. Uh, the kinds of things there are out there, and the cause and effects relationships that structure the interactions between the things that are out there. So there are at least two uh, varieties, at least these two varieties of realism. Realism about unobserved entities, for example, the claim that gases are made up of molecules, i.e. that the molecules and the gases actually exist, and realism about cause-effect relationships. For example, the kinetic theory of gases, uh, which is the claim that in the case of gases, increased heat, for example, causes increased energy or molecular movement, which causes increased volume for the gas, um, or is Equivalent, the same as increased volume for the gas, sorry. So note that due to this, its intuitive appeal, realism almost always has the upper hand in philosophical debates. Now, um, we should talk a bit about in instrumentalism, the competing view. So standing opposed to realism is instrumentalism. Instrumentalists tend to make two kinds of claims. Skeptical claims on the one hand and pragmatic claims on the other. Uh, they're sceptical about claims made by theories about the properties of unobserved entities or about the cause-effect relationships that actually hold out there. And they're pragmatic in recommending that we focus on the usefulness of theories for generating predictions and evaluate them on their ability to do this well. So while they are sceptical about the existence claims theories make, instrumentalists are still happy to talk about uh, the content of theories and the claims that, that they make. Now, one motivation for uh, instrumentalist scepticism is something called inductivism. Uh, this is the method of generating general hypotheses and from, speci from specific observations and made so far to be tested by future observations. So the general always outstrips the specific. So scepticism seems justified, having seen only white swans so far, does not guarantee all swans are white. However, Without any hypotheses, we cannot connect past and future observations. I need to suppose that all swans have some common features if I'm to get knowledge about them, but maybe not whiteness in this case. So one of the more famous schools of instrumental, uh, instrumentalism was positivism. Uh, the positivists were inductivists whose scepticism led them to suppose that general theories added nothing meaningful to scientific observations that they, were, but that they were only really pragmatically useful for organising or connecting up the various observations that we make. So we should talk a bit about arguments for scientific realism. And we have a first argument in and something called the inference to the best explanation. So concordant with the recipe for realism, uh, the arg this argument for realism begins from the predictive success of our best theories. Uh, the piling up of realism con favouring considerations such as uh, our current theories are predictively successful, so number one. And number two, uh, our current theories are indispensable for the useful explanation of nature. Uh, number three, different means of detecting evidence often mutually corroborate our current theories. So heliocentrism, for example, was had two uh, different means to corroborate it, predictions of planetary positions and telescopic observations. Now, the best explanation for one to three is, the exist is that the existence claims of our current theories are correct, or at least close to being correct. Now, this is an inference to the best explanation, to the correctness of our, the existence claims of our current theories. We can chart improvements in theories, as is shown here, by showing how newer ones have more of these features. 
Now, however, this inductive argument still owes much to uh, intuitive appeal, and it faces some immediate challenges from instrumentalism. Most notably, we have a challenge from something called the pessimistic meta-induction. So the pessimistic meta-induction, or the PMI, is an enumerative meta-inductive uh, meta inference uh, across previous specific inductive inferences. So in spite of their predictive successes, most of our previous theories have turned out to be false, strictly speaking. Uh, therefore, by induction, our current predictively successful theories will also turn out to be false. So suppose a timeline stretching from past to future, and above the line is the realm of the true, and below the line is the realm of the false. Now we represent a succession of theories uh, with lines with arrowheads, and after initially being true, all past theories have turned out to be false, so they're dipping below the line. Now our most recent theory on the far right uh, is still in the realm of truth, but... Uh, now, inheritance theories provide a good example. Um, so, the 5th century Hippocratic theory successfully predicts contribution of traits to offspring via mixing of seminal fluids from both parents, but it's now discredited. Darwin's 19th century pangenesis theory successfully predicts traits skipping a generation, but it is now uh, discredited. And our current genetic theories say that all traits inherited by offspring are already present in parental genetic material, but some current epigenetic research is challenging this idea. Now, however, the original statement of the PMI, or the pessimistic meta-induction, is too strong. At best, the falsity of past theories that made successful predictions shows that the ability to make successful predictions is not a good test of truth. And the realist response is something called the no-miracles argument. Um, now, in response, scientific realists add a deductive extension to arguments from the best explanation. Uh, and something called the no-miracles argument, or NMA, points to the extraordinary predictive success of past scientific theories. It then points out that it would have to be a miracle if it turned out that in spite of their predictive success, most of those theories were actually totally false. However, there are no miracles in science, since if we allow appeal to miracles, anything might be explained as being a miracle. Therefore, it must be that most of our scientific theories are true, or at least approximately true, and what they talk about exists, or very likely exists. Now, this can be cast in a standard form as what's called a disjunctive, disjunctive syllogism, and we can see that form of argument here. So either our theories are true, or approximately true, and what they talk about exists, or likely exists, and that this is why they provide successful predictions, or by some miracle, uh, they provide successful predictions in spite of being false. Now, there are no miracles in science, therefore, our theories are true or approximately true, and what they talk about exists or likely exists. Now, however, note that what counts as a miracle has not yet been clearly defined. Now, you'll notice that the PMI, the pessimistic meta-induction, and the NMA, the no miracles argument, are in tension. Each is an attempted refutation of the other. But neither argument is decisive, as both are vague, and so no refutation is possible. So next we have a response from the instrumentalists, and it's a thing called the argument from underdetermination. Now the argument from underdetermination is most relevant as an empirical equivalence claim. This claim asserts that when we have two theories that do an equally good job of explaining the same evidence, or observations, then there is no choosing between them. Something similar will be true when different additions to an original theory, uh, or when we have different additions to original theory that are incompatible. For example, incompatible auxiliary hypotheses that give us different versions of the original theory that do an equally good job of explaining the same evidence. Uh, now, the argument from underdetermination gives us a way of moving away from uh, the diametric opposition of the no miracles argument and the pessimistic meta-induction. However, the argument has sometimes been charged with being a form of relativism. Our reality is relative to the theory you choose, and objectivity is impossible. Now, the best way to illustrate the underdetermination argument is with an example. So we will take ours from theories of generation. So, by the 18th century, it was accepted that both males and females contribute to reproduction, and that a theory of generation or reproduction should explain this. The puzzle was to explain the, the evidence 
The offspring of a particular male and female tends to inherit traits from each of its parents. So note the letters in the word offspring there that are supposed to be indicating this. Now the Hippocratic theory, which was still around from 5th century Greece, explained this with a hypothesis that each parent contributes seminal fluid carrying some traits from that parent. And the fluids mix and combine. So you've got the two mixing colours here symbolise the mixing of the male and female fluids. So it could explain the evidence in this way. Uh, a more recent 17th century uh, theory called ovism supposed the offspring preformed in the female's eggs uh, before birth. Now ovism was inspired by studies of the way birds breed um, with eggs and the way insects are preformed in their cocoons as also are seeds and seedlings as well. So a variant of this theory by Charles Bonnet explained inheritance from both parents by saying that the male's semen modified the features of the already preformed offspring in the female's egg. So the smiley face is used to represent the offspring, uh, that the offspring was already preformed in the female egg, but note the two collars for, uh, to show that both parents are contributing. So it too could explain the evidence. Now, it seems we have two theories, or additions to uh, our theory of generational reproduction, that do an equally good job of explaining the relevant evidence that the offspring of a particular male and female tends to inherit traits from each of its parents. Bonnet's ovism says that semen somehow modifies the already preformed fetus. The Hippocratic theory says that each parent contributes seminal fluids, and somehow they form into a fetus. Now, the underdetermination argument says that since the evidence cannot be used to determine which theory is correct, we're free to choose either. Since we are free to choose either, we should be instrumentalists about theories of generation or reproduction. Since we're free to choose either, we should be instrumentalists about which one is the correct one. Now, another famous example of this uh, argument or of, of, of underdetermination can be found in um, Andreas Osiander's foreword to Copernicus's De Revolutionibus, but I'll leave it for you to find that one for yourself. Now, we have a response from scientific realists. They say that we can point to other things about theories that uh, will help us to determine um, why we should be realists. So in response, scientific realists point out that the ability to explain the relevant evidence is not all that counts. The quality of the explanation counts as well. So likewise, when testing, we value more than just a ease of replication. So besides being predictably successful, mature and non-ad hoc, our best theories have explanatory virtues like simplicity, coherence and unity. So a simple theory is one that makes less assumptions or has fewer parameters either because they are fewer in number or fewer in kind. A coherent theory is one that has the greatest level of consistency and minimises the amount of inconsistency, so no contradictions and minimal if any tensions with other theories that we might accept. And a unified theory is one that can explain phenomena evident or evidence of diverse or events of diverse kinds at once. Uh, it's similar to simplicity but it's about under, uh, unifying various branches of science or perhaps various different theories. Now furthermore we can tell which experimental tests to gather evidence are optimal as optimal experimental tests are direct and stable. So a stable experimental test or of, uh, of a hypothesis H can be replicated despite changes in the apparatus used in the testing, uh, changes in the tester, and changes in what apparatus is used to do the test. A direct experimental test of a hypothesis H involves a minimum of inferential links involving auxiliary hypotheses between H and the evidence E that the experimental test provides. Now, in many ways, these refinement, the refinements of the realism favouring considerations that we reviewed earlier on. Now, we have a final instrumentalist response that talks about the vagueness of these virtues. So there's not, this is not a single argument, it's a bundle of arguments taking issue with the apparent intuitiveness of the scientific realist list of explanatory virtues uh, and criteria for optimal evidence gathering. So as an example, we show the explanatory virtue of simplicity is vague and ambiguous. So simplicity in scientific theory is commonly associated with something called Occam's razor, which says that entities are not to be multiplied beyond necessity, but this still needs interpreting 
and there are ontological and methodological interpretations that are possible. So methodological simplicity says that the simplest theory is the easiest one to grasp uh, that explains the evidence. So favour the theory whose entities make the most uh, make the evidence most understandable. But we also have ontological simplicity. Um, that this says that the simplest theory is the one that ascribes the most simple or elegant structure to nature that explains the evidence. So favour the theory that, given the evidence, involves the most understandable entities. Uh, now, one might favour methodological simplicity or ontological simplicity in explanations, and each interpretation might favour a different theory. Furthermore, favouring ontological simplicity yields greater theory precision and greater fruitfulness, so it seems to be the one that's uh, predominating in our diagram here. While methodological simplicity would seem to yield a theory with fewer parameters, so it only seems to have one factor in its favour, but we have not taken into account something like theory elegance, which is generally a feature associated with methodological simplicity, and so the scale tips back the other way. Now, for an example, we can look at Osiander and Copernicus. They both value the virtue of simplicity. But um, as an example, consider these two quotes from each of them that you can find in the study guide. So Osiander says, Since different hypotheses are sometimes offered for one and the same motion, the astronomer will take as his first choice the hypothesis which is easiest to grasp. And Copernicus says that we should rather heed the wisdom of nature, just as it especially avoids producing anything superfluous or useless, so it frequently prefers to endow a single thing with many effects. Respectively, here we have these two uh, thinkers uh, laying weight on uh, methodological simplicity, in the case of Osiander, and ontological simplicity, in the case of Copernicus, and these two theories have, uh, or these two different weight, weights that are attached to these two different understandings of simplicity, lead each of these two thinkers to favour uh, different accounts. In particular, Copernicus is very much attached to ontological uh, simplicity and to uh, realism about the entities that he posits the existence of, whereas Osiander recommends a more instrumentalist approach. So, just to finish off, we should recap. So, first of all, um, I talked a little bit about uh, scientific realism and instrumentalism and gave definitions of each. And then I talked a bit about a first argument for realism, the argument to the best explanation. And then I talked a little bit about pessimistic meta-induction, which is a first argument for instrumentalism. Then we talked a bit about a, re a realist response in the form of a no miracles argument. And then we talked a little bit about another instrumentalist argument, or argument for instrumentalism, based on the underdetermination of theory by evidence. And then we talked a little bit about a realist response to that argument, in terms of virtuous explanation and optimised testing. And then we talked a little about a realist, uh, instrumentalist cr uh, criticism of that realist argument, uh, that cites that in the cases of some of these virtues, uh, or some of the uh, for theory, or some of these uh, criteria for optimised testing, uh, there can be v vagueness or ambiguity present. Uh, now, next time we'll be talking a bit about rationalism and empiricism, but for the moment, thanks for watching.